Um, Again, I'd like to introduce Lynn. Lynn is an Extension Shoreland Specialist based at UW-Stevens Point. She helps Wisconsin communities who want to protect lakes, streams, and drinking water by providing research-based information, examples from other communities, and policy options. Lynn helped 10 counties custom tailor their Shoreland Zoning Ordinances, wrote Protecting Your Waterfront Investment for Big People, and two lake books for little people, and created the Fish Hotel Kit for elementary school teachers and other educators. She loves swimming, snorkeling, and exploring lakes with her kids, Tate and Tessa. Maybe you've heard about, heard in the news about declines in bees and pollinators. Fewer mayflies for fish too. Want to learn more about these topics and how to relate to the health of your lake? We will look at what research studies have found and then talk about examples of change that have happened in Wisconsin and beyond. So I'm very happy to um, introduce Lynn Markham. Thank you, Sherry. Um, so I'll start with the photo that I think you see here along with the title. Um, as you probably know, this is a photo of a pollinator, um, but it's a pollinator that's special to me. Um, it's a pollinator that I really hope to see in my yard each spring. Um, if in your uh, participant list, if you can use the yes and no, if you can find that, um, from this photo, do you think the pollinator has what it needs? And I'll give you a minute here. Oh, I see some yeses. Oh, I see a no. Mostly yeses. Eric says no. Okay. Well, it's kind of a trick question. Um, obviously, uh, it has flowers. It can get nectar from right now and maybe throughout the day. So it has food for right now. Um, this is a bumblebee on a blueberry flower. Um, but there's a lot we can't tell from the photo. We can't tell if this bee is going to have food tomorrow, you know, how many flowers are there in the area. And we also can't tell if pesticides were applied to either this flower um, or to other plants nearby. Um, if this pollinator does have everything it needs, will people benefit too? If you could weigh in with yes and no. Whoops. There we go. Okay, so I see some yeses popping up. Um, yeah, I kind of gave it away. I wasn't supposed to tell you about the blueberry part right away. But here's my story behind this. Um, I have 50 blueberry bushes in my yard, some in the front yard and some in the back. And if we have enough bumblebees and other pollinators, um, then my family is likely to get lots of blueberries to eat. And I could pretend that my enjoyment of the pollinators is all about the blueberries, um, but it's really not. Um, I've learned to totally enjoy watching the bumblebees. Um, I think they're beautiful and fascinating. And I watch bumblebees and some of the other bees are native bees, like some people watch birds. Um, if the bumblebees don't show up, we won't get blueberries. So each spring I wait and I hope and I keep the fence around the blueberries closed so the deer can't get in and eat the blueberry bushes. Um, I also think and read about new native plants I can add to the blueberry patches so that the bees are fed from spring all the way through fall so there's always something blooming for them to eat. Um, I don't spray pesticides on my blueberry bushes or anywhere else in my yard. Um, our blueberry patches a few years ago used to hum with bumblebees when they were in bloom. And the past couple of years, I've had about three bumblebees that come to my yard. I count them in the spring. Um, and these three bumblebees work for weeks pollinating my blueberries. I spent five minutes <laughs> watching a bumblebee with an app I'm going to talk about um, later in the talk, going from blossom to blossom. And one bumblebee uh, pollinated over 15 blossoms in one minute. So they're really busy. They work hard. Um, so far, my kids and I have lots of blueberries to eat. I do my best to nurture the bees so they'll survive and stick around. 
Um, I don't know if two bumblebees could pollinate all the blossoms on our blueberry bushes. Um, I'm excited to share what I've learned about pollinators with you, and I hope you'll share your experiences with me. Um, working together is how we best help our pollinators and our communities. Um, I also want to say up front that I'm happy to talk more about this topic in the future, either one-on-one -on -one with you or talking with a group that you're a part of. Um, my contact information is listed on the conference handout that I saved to the conference website. Okay, Eric, next, ready for the next slide. All right, so here's a brief outline of what I'm planning to talk about. Um, we'll start talking about who the pollinators are in Wisconsin, a brief introduction to pesticides, um, quite a bit about what does the research show about how pesticides and especially insecticides affect pollinators, and then what can we do. Um, and in that last topic, I'll talk about what we can do in our own yards, what we can do through our food choices, and how we can try to influence um, pollinator habitat um, throughout our communities. Next slide. Okay, so in Wisconsin, who are the pollinators? Um, I've shown a few here. It's a variety of insects, um, bees, butterflies, moths, wasps, as well as the ruby-throated hummingbird in Wisconsin. Next. Um, I also wanted to point out up front that everything is connected. Um, native plants support the ecosystem. Um, native plants provide food for all types of insects, including our pollinators, and those are closely linked to both birds and fish. 96% um, of birds depend entirely on insect protein to feed their young. Um, a chickadee pair needs to collect between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars to feed one clutch of babies. Um, these caterpillars only grow on native plants. Non-native plants can't provide the food um, for the caterpillars, the caterpillars that the birds need to raise their young. Um, and then on the right-hand side there, up to 40% of freshwater fish protein comes from insects that dropped into the water from plants on land. So we have a lot of the fish food is coming from the insects, the terrestrial insects, at least as adults. Can you click it, Eric? or Sherry, sorry. Um, so what this shows is um, some work by Doug Tallamy. Um, he's a professor in Delaware. He came to the Wisconsin Lakes Conference a few years ago, and this is some information he put together about the plants that support the greatest number of species of butterflies and moths. So the ones that I've circled up top um, are kind of our superfoods for insects. You can see oaks, black cherries, um, willows, birches, can support a lot of different species. And then the same for the non-woody plants on the right. Goldenrod, which is good for me, I've got tons of goldenrod in my yard, um, as well as some of these other plants. So those are kind of the plants that are the most helpful um, to insects. Another click, Eric. Um, now I'm showing, <clears throat> excuse me, two different books um, that I really like on this topic. Um, the one on the left, Bringing Nature Home, is by Doug Tallamy. He talks about which native plants will support um, the butterflies and moths, the caterpillars of which um, feed the birds, are the food that birds need for their young. Um, and the one on the right, I just picked up recently, and I love this one too, um, pollinators of native plants. So you can look up any, well, not any native plant, but lots of native plants um, from Wisconsin and the Midwest. And it will tell you which pollinators you can expect to see if you plant those. Um, so kind of fun there. Next. Okay, so I want to start by acknowledging Marla Spivak. Um, she's a professor who's been studying bees in Minnesota for many years, and I find her inspirational. Um, this is one of her slides. Um, in Wisconsin, we have 500 wild bee species, so a lot of different types. All of them are pollinators, and all of them are beneficial. Bees have co-evolved with flowers. When we have lots of flowers on native plants, that leads to lots of bees, and lots of bees leads to lots of flowers, 
as well as the fruit and seed that comes from those flowers. Next. Um, honeybees and all of our bees are in decline currently. Um, this diagram is specific for honeybees because we've studied them the most, so we know the most about them. We think there are four things that are causing bee decline. Um, the first is bees are subject to a lot of pathogens and parasites. The second is bees run into a lot of pesticides. And the third is in some places, bees have poor nutrition due to lack of habitat. Um, we'll look at a few examples of bee habitat in a minute. Um, providing bees with better nutrition really will help bees deal with both the pesticides, detoxifying them, and with the pathogens. Next. Um, this is a list of our endangered, threatened, and special concern pollinators in Wisconsin. I'm not going to go through each one, but I just wanted to show you a few of them. Um, including we've got a couple species of bumblebees, plus a bunch of butterflies, and a few moths that are all on that list right now. Next slide. Okay, unfortunately, this is what a lot of our residential areas look like. Can you click it again? Um, this isn't good habitat for any pollinators because there are no flowers. Um, this is really not good habitat for anything except maybe Canada geese. Um, so the question becomes, how can we make this area more hospitable to pollinators? Okay, next slide. Um, you can see the contrast here. Um, a pollinator in this area has lots of options. Um, this is actually right outside, the photo was taken right outside of the building where I typically work. Um, and we can provide habitat for our pollinators by having a diversity of plants that bloom throughout the season. This was taken in the fall um, with the monarchs getting ready to uh, migrate south. Next slide. Um, we've also learned that honeybees and possibly other bees need medicinal plant resins inside their hives to stay healthy. Um, let's see. In Minnesota and Wisconsin, Marla and her students have found that this medicinal resin, it's called propolis, um, comes mainly from cottonwood and poplar trees. So not only do we need these native plant flowers around, but we also need certain types of trees in order to keep our bees healthy. And that kind of also fits with the research that found um, that diverse landscapes, not all of one, not all corn or not all soybeans or whatever, um, is much healthier for our bees and pollinators. Next slide. Okay, a little introduction to pesticides. So a pesticide is any substance or mixture um, intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pest. Um, we have lots of pesticides out there, more than 600 ingredients and more than 25,000 different products, pesticide products on the market. Um, pesticides are commonly broken down into three main categories. The first one is insecticides, and that's what we'll talk about the most today. You can imagine insecticides are meant to kill insects. Um, and this includes a class of pesticides that are called neonicotinoids. Um, they call them neonics for short. Um, these neonics um, can be harmful or fatal to bees, as well as to other beneficial insects that might eat mosquitoes or other insects that we're trying to get rid of. Um, fungicides, um, this is the one on the top right, Mancozeb is an example of a fungicide. Um, they can have detrimental effects on bee nutrition if they destroy basically the yeasts and microorganisms in the bee's guts. You've probably heard about microbiomes in people. Well, we're starting to think about the same in bees. And then the top, or I'm sorry, the bottom two photos um, show some examples of herbicides. Um, so you're probably aware that Roundup is an herbicide. Um, but also, if you see this weed and feed, um, sometimes called turf builder, um, the weed part of weed and feed means herbicide plus feed is the fertilizer. 
Um, so the herbicides kill flowers in or around fields or lawns um, that provide the nectar and pollen for bees. Next. So if someone chooses to spray or otherwise apply pesticides, where do they go after they're sprayed? Next. Um, the people who apply the pesticides, and we've also learned the people who live within a mile or two of where the pesticides are applied, um, end up with pesticides in their bodies. Um, some pesticides bind to soil, and so then if they get on somebody's shoes, they get tracked into homes. Um, we've looked at studies about how far pesticides drift in the air. And if it's a windy day with a little dust in the air, they will drift for miles. Um, some pesticides become part of the plants that are food for pollinators or food for people or both. Um, and once they get into pollinators or other insects, they're also going to move throughout the food web to the birds or fish or whoever eats the insects. Um, pesticides can go into our lakes and streams if they dissolve in water. Um, for that reason, they can also get into our drinking water. Um, our most recent statewide drinking water study found pesticides in 42% of private wells. That's up from 33% um, a few years earlier. So everything is really connected. Um, once pesticides are put out in a field or on a lawn or on a shrub, um, we don't have a way to contain them. They're going to spread wherever they can spread. Next. Um, I wanted to show um, how insecticide use has changed over time. Um, so we began using DDT as an insecticide in the 1940s um, due to evidence that it harmed eagles and songbirds. It was banned 30 years later in Wisconsin in 1970. And you can see that we've moved through three different classes of insecticides since 1990. Currently, neonics are the insecticides used in the greatest quantity, though we still have widespread use of pyrethroids too. Um, if you can click it forward. As shown in the graph there on the bottom, um, the use of neonics has increased greatly from 2000 to 2015 in the United States. A question about any pesticide is what effects does it have on non-target organisms? With our current regulatory system, it often takes 10 years or more to fully answer that question of what the effects are. In the meantime, we have manufacturers seeking approval of new pesticides each year. And if you could click twice. Great. Um, so this is an example. Um, this news article is from 2019. And it announces that the EPA will allow the use of a pesticide considered very highly toxic to bees. The first sentence of this article reads, the EPA approved broad new applications for a controversial insecticide, despite objections from environmental groups and beekeepers who say it is among the compounds responsible for eviscerating the nation's bee populations. This pesticide is an insecticide called sulfoxiflor. Um, we know that pesticides lose their effectiveness over time as pests develop resistance to them. Um, people may then apply higher levels of pesticides or mixtures of pesticides, and this is the reason that pesticide manufacturers look for approval of new pesticides. I think a key question related to pollinator health is can we use methods other than pesticides to control pests? And certainly we've done that in the past before we had pesticides. And we have farmers who do it today as well, as well as homeowners. Next slide. Um, these are just a few examples of neonics in the news. Um, neonics were implicated in colony collapse disorder in honeybees, one of many factors. Um, this started happening around 2006. The honeybee, the worker bees, would fly away from the hive and they just never came back. They didn't find dead bees laying around, they just disappeared. Um, the neonics also um, have risks to other pollinators, the bumblebees, other native bees, and butterflies. Next slide. 
Um, so now I want to get into treating for mosquitoes, how it's typically done, um, as well as what impacts that um, has been found to have on other insects. Um, so in recent years in my area, I've seen more and more signs along the road and gotten flyers in the mail from companies offering chemical mosquito control. Um, they treat for mosquitoes by either using these barrier sprays that they spray on the plants, and then if the mosquitoes eat the plants, they die, or they use what's called um, ultra-low volume sprays that produce tiny droplets that stay in the air and kill mosquitoes when they contact them. Next slide, please. Um, this is Karen Oberhauser. She spent about 30 years studying monarchs in Minnesota, and now she's moved to the Madison Arboretum. Um, what her research shows is the, the pyrethroids, this is one class of insecticides, used to kill mosquitoes, kill all insects, kill fireflies, kill butterflies, kill bees. Um, Karen's research found high mortality of monarch caterpillars after they were fed milkweed leaves that had been treated or sprayed with a pyrethroid up to three weeks earlier. So even three weeks later, there's enough there to kill the monarchs. Um, let's see, I think that's all for this slide. Um, the pesticides commonly used for mosquito control in the US, um, nearly all of these pesticides are highly toxic to honeybees with direct exposure. And what these numbers show is that a gram of any of these pesticides. So you can see we've got the 1990s class, the 2000s class, and the 2010. Um, one gram is enough to kill about 500,000 bees. And a gram is about the weight of a paper clip. Next slide. We have some natural options for mosquito control that aren't as detrimental to our pollinators. Um, the first is to remove standing water. Um, we know that mosquito larvae require about 14 days in standing water um, before they're adult mosquitoes. So if we can prevent it from getting up to 14 days, that can do the trick. Um, most rain gardens are only full of water for maybe a day or two. So it's not an issue because they don't get up to 14 days. Um, outdoor fans, like the ceiling fans shown here on the deck, can be really helpful in just shushing the insects away. Um, similarly, if we get some of the natural predators like swallows and bats, they can eat a lot of mosquitoes. Um, and then one more click. If needed, we can use a biological control. Um, one that's out there is called BTI. Um, this is something that kills the larva mosquitoes. Um, so you would put it in standing water if it's an area where it can't be trained. Okay, next slide. Another natural option for mosquito control is dragonflies. Um, both the adult dragonflies and the juveniles are voracious predators of mosquitoes. Um, the adults eat basically anything that flies that they can get a hold of. Um, flies, gnats, mosquitoes, ants, beetles. And dragonflies spend most of their lives as nymphs underwater. Um, and as nymphs, as shown in the bottom photo, they're also eating mosquitoes. They're eating the mosquito larvae. So they're helpful below water and above water. Um, next slide. What do aquatic insects need? Um, so if we broaden from dragonflies and think more broadly, um, the studies looking at land use have shown that to have healthy aquatic insect populations and diversity, um, we need those native plants along the shoreline, the buffers. Um, so we wanna minimize plant removal as well as hard surfaces like patios um, within 50 feet of shore. Um, we also want to minimize the levels of nutrients and silt entering the lake. We know specifically that um, when we have a lot of nutrients going in, it uses up some of the oxygen in the water, and then the nymph versions of dragonflies and other insects can't survive due to lack of oxygen in the water. Um, in the lake, we need, or the aquatic insects need, a diversity of substrates. 
So they need sand and gravel and rocks, um, not just all silt. Um, they need those areas where they can lay their eggs and their eggs get enough oxygen to turn into a nymph. Um, natural soft shorelines, not areas armored with seawall, riprap, or bridges and culverts, um, and they need the aquatic plants. Um, this slide is from a worldwide study published in 2019 about the decline of insects. Um, the first point here is that for the types of aquatic insects shown here, we have a lot of species in trouble. Um, about 40% of the mayfly, the dragonfly, and the damselfly species are in trouble. And if we can click again, you'll see that 63% of the caddisfly species are in trouble. Um, the next point is to look at the reasons that these species are disappearing. Um, you can see water pollution from fertilizers and pesticides are the main reason that mayflies and caddisflies are disappearing. Um, like I mentioned a minute ago, for dragonflies, it's fertilizer. They seem to be a bit more resistant to the pesticides, but dragonfly nymphs are definitely impacted by fertilizer getting into the water. Uh, next slide, and go ahead and click three more times. Um, I looked up the toxicity of these classes of insecticides to bees, aquatic insects, fish, and birds. Um, as you can see, all of these insecticides are toxic to animals other than the ones they're meant to kill. So this isn't a new problem. This is a problem we've had with insecticides for a long time, that they're not, they harm more than just what we're um, using them for, trying to get rid of the pest. Um, next. Um, this news article from earlier this year shows the impact of how we manage the land on mayflies, an aquatic insect mentioned in the introduction. Um, the populations of mayflies in the upper Mississippi basin has dropped by 52% from 2012 to 2019. These dropping populations are significant because the insects are food for fish, birds, and mammals. Also, mayflies transfer literally tons of nutrients from the water where they grow up as nymphs to the land as they move landward as adults. Um, possible reasons that we're seeing the mayfly declines are neonic pesticide levels and fertilizers. Um, like I said, the fertilizers cause these dead zones, areas where there isn't enough oxygen and mayflies, like dragonflies, are bottom-dwelling as nymphs, um, so they need the oxygen down in the bottom. Next, I'm going to keep this slide short, but I just wanted to let you know that we also now have a few studies finding that neonics reduce the aquatic insect populations and the zooplankton growth in our lakes, and this in turn reduces the fish harvests in some species. This study was smelt in Japan. Um, but it's also been seen with other fish species. So again, everything is connected. Um, if we look at this lake food pyramid, um, you can see that the neonicotinoids are going to impact the insect layer or the invertebrate layer here, um, which then means less food for fish. Um, whereas the herbicides, the weed killers, are going to kill the plants um, down on the bottom layer which then reduces the food for the insects, which reduces the food for the fish. Um, you would see something similar if it was on land, the plants on the bottom, then the plant eaters, and then the higher predators. Next. Okay, so a few ideas for helping pollinators in your own yard. Um, the first one is not spraying um, and not using the weed and feed products um, that minimize the flowers um, that are available. Um, when you go to the nursery, if you can look and make sure that the plants that you're buying aren't treated plants, aren't pre-treated with pesticide, um, and planting that variety of native plants that bloom throughout the season. Another thing is to recognize that some chewing on your plants is actually a good thing. <laughs> it means that you're feeding insects and caterpillars um, that feed the birds, that feed the pollinators, um, the monarch here 
Um, this time of year, we're looking for monarch caterpillars around our house. And my daughter the other day came in with a monarch caterpillar about an inch long, and she had found it because she found chew marks on some of those milkweed leaves. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is this Weeby application. Um, this just came out from a lab down in Madison that specializes in bees. It's called the um, Graton Lab. And I have had a lot of fun with it. Um, it's very easy to learn to use. There's a little YouTube video and a couple like self quizzes that you take. And you're not identifying bees by species, but just by general groups, bumblebees, large black bees, small black bees, flies, and other. Um, and they use it to find out what the levels of different types of bees are throughout the state. Um, and you'll be able to compare your area with other areas of the state. And it's also to answer the question for people who are growing crops, do you have enough bees in your area to fully pollinate those crops? So this is what I was using when I found out that one bumblebee um, pollinated 15 flowers in a minute. So it's a fun application. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about pesticide use on Wisconsin crops. Um, we, the farmers report applying about 13 million pounds of pesticides per year. So this works out to about two pounds per person for each person in the state. Um, by comparison, our annual use on turf is around a million pounds in Wisconsin, so it's about tenfold less. But I want to balance that by saying that oftentimes on a per acre basis, pesticide use is higher on people's yards and lawns than it is on ag fields. So something to keep in mind. Next slide. Um, this just shows the main crops grown in Wisconsin by acre um, and how many pounds of pesticides are applied to them. So you can see that on an annual basis, we've got about 11.7 million pounds of pesticides in Wisconsin. That's 90% of our total pesticide use is for crops that aren't for human consumption, for corn and soybeans. Um, if we could click. Most of our field corn goes for livestock feed, to feed meat and dairy, um, and ethanol for vehicle fuel. So most of the pesticides in Wisconsin are used to support these products. And I think the question for us to consider is, is that what we want to support? Next. Um, just a couple of points here. I wanna focus on the first and the last points on this slide. Um, first of all, it's important to know neonics are systemic pesticides. So they're taken up by the plant and then they're present in all parts of the plant. Um, nearly all field corn and about a third of soybeans planted today um, use a neonic. Um, oftentimes it's coated seed as shown there in the bottom right. Next. And the plants growing from neonic treated seeds or sprayed with neonics later can have nectar and pollen that's lethal to insects, including our essential pollinators. It's also important to realize that the neonics are water soluble. Next slide. Um, we find neonics in streams and groundwater in Wisconsin. And as we talked about earlier, they can affect aquatic insects. Um, in terms of government policies, um, the European Union placed a moratorium on the three main neonics in 2013, and that is still in place and has actually been expanded. It was expanded in 2018. Um, Ontario, Canada has committed to cutting their neonic use by 80%. Um, and the US EPA was reviewing um, the neonic research um, for 10 years. And just recently, this spring, they put forth a proposal that the five main neonics um, remain on the market. And that's currently in a public comment period, if you want to comment on that. Next slide. Um, unless you grow all of your own food, we all need farmers. And there are lots of different ways to farm. Um, here are two different views from farmers um, in Wisconsin on neonics. Um, on the left, a southern Wisconsin farmer with 4,000 acres of corn and soybeans 
said he's willing to spend a few extra dollars per acre for neonic coated corn seed to protect it from pests because grain prices have collapsed and our profit margin won't allow us much wiggle room. Cutworms can kill off 40 to 80% of the seedlings and then there are wireworms and other kinds of pests. Another farmer from southern Wisconsin who's also a beekeeper says neonics have allowed people to ignore good agronomic processes. We don't have to rotate crops anymore. We just kill everything off with neonics. If we make conservation crop rotation a big push in Wisconsin, so farmers don't have the pest and disease problems they're currently trying to solve with neonics, that would be a big help. So some very different views out there. And I just wanted to show you, this is the, what farmers in Wisconsin have reported in terms of their pesticide use on different crops. Um, and this is from the National Agricultural Statistics Survey. Um, you can see on the left hand side, so what this is showing is pounds of pesticides applied per acre per year. So on the left hand side, you have crops like cabbage, oats, and green peas that have very low levels of pesticides applied. Kind of in the middle is corn and soybeans, and field corn is at two pounds per acre per year. And then some of our higher crops, snap beans are at three, and then onions, carrots, and potatoes all have significantly higher um, pounds of pesticides per acre. Um, we don't have any recent data for Wisconsin for cranberries, apples, or cherries for our fruit crops. Um, apples and cherries, that data was last collected in 2005, and we don't have data for Wisconsin cranberries. Next. So what can we do? Next slide. Um, when we're choosing food for our families, sometimes we can talk to the people who grew it, and other times we can't. Um, the Farm Fresh Atlases provide an opportunity to learn about and support local farmers you can talk with. Um, the Farm Fresh Atlas talks about what crops each farm grows, as well as what their growing practices are. And if you can click one time there, there we go. Those are the fronts of the Farm Fresh Atlases. This is 2019. I'm not sure if there's a 2020 version that's out there. Um, they're typically available um, from the land conservation offices, and they may be available at grocery stores or other places as well. Um, if you have the opportunity to talk with farmers and you want to support people who minimize pesticide use, here are some questions you can ask them. Um, how do they control weeds and insects? Do they spray or use coated seeds? If so, what pesticides are they using? Um, do they have pollinator habitat or beneficial insect habitat on their farm? The beneficial insects are the ones that will eat the crop pests. Um, some of this habitat could be prairie, it could be woods, it could be fence lines that are left intact. Um, and are they certified organic? If you can click one more. Um, certified organic um, means they're grown without synthetic pesticides. It's very different than natural. A lot of times you'll see natural, especially on food in boxes, um, and there is no definition for natural. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that um, there's also a requirement now for um, farms that are certified organic to have some um, insect habitat on their farms. Next slide. Um, you can consider growing or buying unsprayed um, food, or if you don't know the farmers, if it's organic, that'll tell you it's unsprayed. Um, organic food sales are growing quickly in the U.S. and worldwide. Um, you can see from the graph that it's gone up steeply in the last number of years. Um, in a survey from 2016, 82% of U.S. households said they purchase organic food on a regular basis. And the reasons that they stated they chose organic food, the first most common reason was it's healthier for me and my children. The next reason was to avoid persistent pesticides. And the third reason was to avoid antibiotics and growth hormones. 
Next slide. Um, we have more organic food sales, and when we have that, then we end up with more organic acres. Um, we have about 1,300 organic farms in Wisconsin. We have lots of options for organic farms. We're second in the nation. Only California has more organic farms. Um, by the same token, organic farms are only two to three percent of the total farms and the total farmland acres in Wisconsin. Next one. Um, when we choose to eat organic, um, we have a number of studies, the seven shown here, um, that show that it significantly lowers um, people's exposure to pesticides. Um, because those pesticides aren't applied to the crops, I assume it also um, reduces pollinators' exposure. One more click. Um, the 2019 study listed here found that after only six days of eating organic food, adults and children had on average a 60% reduction in the levels of synthetic pesticides measured in their urine compared to when they were eating a conventional or non-organic diet. Next slide. Um, maybe some of you have seen um, this Dirty Dozen Clean 15. It's based on um, pesticide data that's collected every year based on food from grocery stores across the US. The US Department of Ag um, analyzes those food samples um, and the Dirty Dozen are the foods that they find the highest levels of pesticides on and the most toxic pesticides. The Clean 15 are the opposite end of the spectrum. The foods that have no pesticides are very little pesticide and not the more toxic pesticides. Um, so I was curious how people risk compared with bee risk. So I looked up um, the pesticide results for these foods and looked for, bee, for pesticides that are known to be toxic to bees. Um, on the Dirty Dozen side, 12 of the 13 listed here um, frequently contain pesticides highly toxic to bees, neonics or others. On the Clean 15, you find pretty much the opposite. Um, of the 15, only one of them routinely um, contains a pesticide that's toxic to bees. Um, so one thing that I think most people have some option for is to eat more of the Clean 15 and maybe less of the Dirty Dozen. The other option is to grow some of your own of the Dirty Dozen or find a farmer nearby or an organic farm um, that can supply these. Um, strawberries at the top, I don't know if you guys are getting strawberries up by Spooner. Um, we just had the first couple out of the patch in our backyard and I grow our strawberries because I know that um, if I buy the conventional ones at the store, they're likely to have a fair amount of pesticide on it. Okay, next slide. Um, let me just explain briefly um, <laughs> my thought process. Um, a number of years ago, I was at the grocery store and it looked kind of like this. There were organic green peppers on the top shelf and non-organic green peppers on the bottom shelf. At the time, we ate fajitas once a week and so I needed to buy two green peppers. And I looked at the prices for them and I took two green peppers and I put them on the scale and I calculated that it would cost about one extra dollar per week to buy organic peppers versus conventional peppers. And after thinking about that for a while, if someone was watching me, they realized I stood there for a long time in front of the green peppers. Um, I decided, yeah, we could swing that. Um, and so since then, I haven't spent as much time standing in front of the green peppers. Okay, next slide. Um, so in terms of helping pollinators with our food choices, um, what the studies on organic agriculture have found is that it supports high, higher biodiversity in both crops and pollinator habitat. Um, it can play an important role in protecting and supporting bees and other beneficial insects, and it avoids most pesticides that are toxic to bees. Um, I'm running a little behind here, so I'll just tell you that the top photo is a tomato plant. You can tell what the middle one is, one of my favorites. And the bottom one is alfalfa, which we've probably not eaten alfalfa recently for lunch or breakfast. Um, but alfalfa is a big crop in Wisconsin for both dairy cows as well as beef cattle. Um, and it relies on bees. Okay, helping pollinators in our communities. So what can we do that way? 
Um, like Marla from Minnesota said, um, good pollinator nutrition leads to stronger immune systems in our pollinators, as well as stronger detox systems. Um, so if we can restore or maintain flower-rich road right-of-ways, power lines, um, rail lines, parks, schools um, that are unsprayed, that helps. Um, communities in Wisconsin can't ban pesticide use throughout their community because we have a state preemption law against that, but they can limit pesticide use or not allow pesticide use on the publicly owned lands, um, the city or village or county lands. Um, both Douglas County and Village of Shorewood um, do this. Okay, so just to summarize, um, what our pollinators really need is good, clean bee food and lots of it. Um, and when they have that, it helps us too. Um, the foods shown in this photo at the bottom are all pollinated. Um, and if we didn't have our pollinators, we wouldn't have this variety of foods. And that's what I have for today. Um, just leaving you with a sentiment that everything's connected. And I would be happy to answer questions or respond to comments. Thank you very much, Lynn. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. So if you have any questions, please use the chat function at the bottom of the screen. Oh, I see there's a question um, says, I am a student from UWSP. What building do you work in? Um, I work in the College of Natural Resources. And that photo was taken from the south side of it um, where the mural is. Um, and it was crazy um, last fall. I used to go out there every time I got to take a break because for about a week, there were hundreds of monarchs congregated on that rough blazing star, the light purple flower that you saw there. Hey Lynn, this is Eric Olson. Um, you mentioned the people that are doing the mosquito prevention spraying techniques and going around. I've seen yard signs for this. I know my neighbors, some of my neighbors do this. Do we have statistics on how fast that application is growing? How fast is the market, if you will, or the number of properties or acres being treated by these uh, mosquito prevention folks? Yeah, that's a good question, Eric. I haven't looked into that. Um, I don't know for sure. I have a few of those signs popping up in my neighborhood, neighbors who have chosen that. Um, but I don't know how the acres are growing or not growing. I, I am curious. I mean, are you seeing this in Northwest Wisconsin, Mosquito Squad or Mosquito Joe or True Green um, Mosquito Control? Are you seeing these signs? You could, I don't know if you can talk out loud or hit yes if you're seeing them. Uh, this is Sherry. I live, I live pretty much in the middle of nowhere. And yes, the last two years, we've been seeing a lot of those signs. Okay. Okay. And are people acting on them? Are they hiring these contractors? That I don't know. Uh -huh. But we do have a, a question um, from Madeline that she's heard that pesticides break down after application. Would this reduce their impact on other organisms? Right. That's a good question. Um, it depends on the pesticide. We have about 80 different pesticides that farmers report, 80 different ingredients that um, are reported to be used on ag crops in Wisconsin. And some of them break down much faster than others. Um, some of them, you know, are largely gone within a few days or a week. And others, it may take months before they're down to 50% of what was originally applied. The other thing to keep in mind is it depends on what they break down into. When you say pesticide breakdown products, some people think, oh, well, they're safe then. And they're not necessarily. It just depends on the, what the parent compound, the original pesticide is. And when it breaks down, it could be more or less toxic than the original chemical. So it really depends. You can look up the half-life, um, how long it takes to break down. And for most pesticides, it depends a lot on the conditions, whether it's in the sun or not, whether it has oxygen or not, you know, whether it's underground in the soil or whether it's in water or whether it's sitting out on a leaf. So there are a lot of factors that figure into how quickly it breaks down. 
I got a question here from Kelsey out there. Uh, Kelsey asks, considering that 90% of pesticide use was used on livestock feed crops and fuel, could society transitioning to a higher diversity of a more plant-based foods help reduce pesticide use and help pollinators overall? Yeah, um, I think that it can, yes. Um, there are at least three different ways to approach this that I've thought of. Um, one is simply to eat fewer animal products, a more plant-based diet. Um, one is to choose, if you're, if you're going to eat meat or eat dairy, to choose that that's raised on pasture rather than on corn and soybeans. Um, our pasture crops tend to have much lower pesticide applications. Um, and also, well-managed pasture can be a total boon for the pollinators. You know, if you've got the clover and other things out there, they can have a lot to eat from that. And the same is true for an alfalfa field that's, you know, just cut for hay. Um, and then the third is, um, I grew up in Wisconsin, I like my cheese, um, and I choose to buy mostly organic dairy products um, so that I know that the feed that fed the cow, that produced the milk for the cheese, um, they ate crops that weren't treated with pesticides. There are a small number of pesticides allowed on organic crops, um, but an analysis a couple years ago estimated that um, organic foods have about 97% less pesticide than non-organic foods. I got a yeah. comment here from Gary Erickson as well. Sorry, Sherry, these folks are messaging me. Uh, for some reason, the, the uh, chat feature isn't working too well. Gary just wanted to point out that he's got bumblebees in his high bush blueberries this year more than ever. Um, and the bushes Ooh, are just... Can I borrow some? <laughs> <laughs> says they hum all day long and he hopes it's a good sign for the future. He always has good blueberry crops. I asked him exactly where he's from. I haven't heard back. Uh, but Gary's awesome. been having success with the blueberries. Yeah. The bees. Good to hear. Go ahead, Sherry. Oh, I, I have a question from Lydia. How do you feel about pesticides being used on certain species like invasives during habitat restoration efforts, especially this year since we were not able to burn in some areas? I know some people are resorting to pesticide use in order to keep these species under control. Right, right. I'm not an expert on invasives. I know most, if not all of them, can be really challenging. Um, I, most of my looking at pesticides has been more linked to human health. And I guess what I can say from that perspective is we know that even some of the pesticides that some people consider safe um, do have serious human health impacts. Um, I don't know um, the pesticides that are used for um, invasive species control, um, whether they have large impacts on um, our pollinators or not. Um, it does remind me of one other thing I wanted to mention in terms of unintended consequences. There was a question from Northeast Wisconsin in the last couple of days um, about whether spraying um, your yard for mosquitoes can impact the purple loosestrife beetles um, that control that. And I did some emailing back and forth with an entomology professor, and he said they have seen major impacts um, to the purple loosestrife beetles as a result of mosquito spraying. We did have a question from someone uh, about the onions and noting that, you know, on this chart in particular, uh, onions do seem to get a pretty hefty dose of pesticides on a, on a per acre basis. Right. Uh, and then further down here, <laughs> yep, I just make it on the other side of the... On the Queen 15. Yeah. Right. So why? Yeah. Um, well, onions like potatoes, and I would imagine the same is true for carrots, all root crops, right? Um, in Wisconsin, because we get 32 inches of rain per year, 
we the those root crops grown here are more prone to um, issues with uh, blight and other fungus. Um, so the the high pesticide use on root crops in Wisconsin is typically due to fungicides used on them. Whereas if onions are grown in a drier climate where the only water they get is what's applied by irrigation rigs, um, they have a lesser need for fungicide use. Um, so what you're looking at here on Clean 15 is nationwide US Department of Ag data. And what you were looking at um, on the other slide, the graph, is Wisconsin specific data. So that's right. my best explanation for that one. It's a good question. I got one more question from Mary Jo. Uh, she has challenges with insects on her apples and mm -hmm. she also is raising bees and she's come across things that are called organocides that are listed as bee safe. Do we know much about organocides or, or um, treatments that are listed as being safe for bees? Yeah. Um, I'm not an expert on uh, raising apples organically. <laughs> I, I give you some kudos, Mary Jo. I, I have a couple apple trees in our yard um, and I kind of pay attention to them. I'm not familiar with organocides. Um, you could look and see if they're on the allowed list of pesticides for um, organic production. That's pretty easy to find online or I can send it to you. Um, there's also, uh, we have an organic apple grower, actually she's a sustainable apple grower who uses organic practices. Um, the name of the orchard is Grandview Orchard. It's near Anago and the owner's name is Lisa Redinger. She's having a lot of uh, success. She's growing beautiful apples without using pesticides. Um, so that's someone you could reach out to. And I know on a smaller scale, people can use these sort of apple bags that you can put over uh, once, once the apple itself has been pollinated. You can protect them from things coming onto them with physical barriers. And I know Jay Dampier, I don't know if anybody here has heard of Jay Dampier, but he's an extension educator. He's based out of the central part of the state, but he connects with master gardeners all across the state. If you find him online, you can actually ask him how his... Um, physical barriers to protect apples are working out for him. He's keeping a lot of records and uh, mm -hmm. he could probably fill you in on his success. Mm -hmm. Another method I've seen used on apples is a smelly sugar trap. Um, they usually take a milk jug and cut off uh, kind of part of one side and they put cider vinegar, sugar, and banana peels in it. And it just kind of ferments and the bugs love it. Um, and so they tend to go in that rather than on the apples. I've benefited from a lot of apples from trees treated that way too. Well, it is 2.30, so I would like to thank Lynn again for, for spending some time with us today. Uh, our next session is Wisconsin Citizen-Based Monitoring, Volunteering for Nature. If you'd like to go to a different session, uh, just go back out to the agenda and uh, you can find the links there.